Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes Bend your knees and your elbows And look and see If everybody is doing it too Just like you Stop bobbing up and down with your arms to the side Then flap them up and down like a butterfly And look and see if everybody is doing it too Just like you Good morning everyone and welcome to the Barnes Children's Literature Festival, the largest dedicated children's literature festival in the world. My name is Nicolette Jones, I review the children's books for the Barnes and I sat on lots of platforms with Judith Carr and had many joyous times with her and so I'm sorry to be here. I'm sorry that Judith, who was so much loved by us all, is not with us on what would have been her 97th birthday. I'm also sorry that we're not in Barnes for all the reasons behind that. Though had Judith survived to share another festival, I have no doubt that she would have mastered Crowdcast immediately. I remember though that one of Judith's many talents was to savour every moment and enjoy what life offered. And in that spirit, I'm very glad to welcome the wonderful artists Lauren Child and Axel Scheffler, who like me were proud to call Judith a friend. And I'm also glad that though we can't be around the corner from Judith's home in Barnes, these circumstances bring together her fans from all over the world. I know people are watching in at least a score of countries, including India and Pakistan, Australia, <coughs> New Zealand, Singapore, Japan, Taiwan, Italy, the Netherlands, Serbia, Israel, Saudi Arabia, I can't mention them all, uh, but very well, very warm welcome <coughs> to everybody and also to those of you in Barnes. A few words first, just about Lauren and Axel. Lauren is a truly original artist and comic writer who is our last children's laureate and is the creator of Charlie and Lola, Clarice Bean, Ruby Redford, and a host of beautiful picture books, as well as re-illustrating Pippi Longstocking and Mary Poppins. She has an MBE, is a UNESCO artist for peace, and on the Durham Commission for Creativity in Education. She's an inspiration to us all. Axel, in case you are new to this planet, is the illustrator of The Gruffalo, which has sold millions and is now a play, a ride at the Chessington World of Adventures and has appeared in an episode of Doctor Who. He was born in Hamburg and studied there and at the Bath Academy in Wiltshire. He's now one of our most loved illustrators, not only for his collaborations with Julia Donaldson, but also for his own books, including his Pip and Posy series. And Judith. I'll just remind you that she created timeless and beautiful picture books ever since A Tiger Came to Tea in 1968, including, of course, her books about Mog the Cat. And that's not the title, by the way. I knew the title is The Tiger Who Came to Tea. Um, uh, and she never stopped working. She published 10 books after the age of 80. She had her first bestseller at the age of 93 and it raised 1.5 million pounds for Save the Children's Literacy Fund. Uh, her last book, The Curse of the School Rabbit, was published just posthumously. She had an OBE and she was also a very important witness to history. Born in Berlin in 1923, she was obliged to leave Germany in 33 when the life of her father, Alfred Carr, who was an outspoken opponent of the Nazis, was under threat. Her experience as a child of living in Switzerland and France and then coming to England is recorded in her fictionalized trilogy, beginning with When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit. Now I'm going to ask you both, Axel and Lauren, first of all, how you knew Judith. Tell us the circumstances in which you knew her. Who would like to start? Lauren, tell us first. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, 
I first met um, Judith at an exhibition. I went to uh, what used to be the illustration cupboard and it was a tiny gallery and it was completely crammed with people. And I, and Judith was very, very short <laughs> and she was perfect, but quite little. And so in, in, in this sort of hubbub, it, you know, you could easily sort of miss her because everyone's sort of looking like this and it was really, really crowded. And I looked around and then I saw her and and I remember being really nervous to talk to her and I, I almost didn't. I remember speaking to her um, PR, who's a friend of mine also, and and saying, oh, you know, that's Judith Carr. I'd really like to say hello. And she said, oh, no, no, do. She would really like to say hello. She's she She'll be really pleased to meet you and she was and it was so it was because it's always very um intimidating meeting people that you greatly admire because if they're not it's super keen to see you you, you feel rather um bored by it and, it and it could be a sad moment but in fact it was wonderful to meet her she just could not be nicer and i think the thing that always struck me about judith is she always would speak to anyone on a level. So it's not, I am this marvelous author, illustrator, um, and and I've earned my place. She's always just talked to you like a, almost like a sort of jobbing illustrator. So she talked talk to you, you know, about what it was like to write, what, you know, did you find things difficult? How did you come up with that idea? Don't you find the writing bit really hard? And so you have very, very nice conversations and I, I love that because it means you can pick up the phone and have a really, really important sort of colleague conversation. And she always, she always had that extraordinary warmth and a kind of willingness and an yeah. interest in people, I think, whoever it was. And certainly in fellow, fellow artists and illustrators, um, she, she seemed to feel a kind of kindred spirit. Which is why she never felt old, because she's, she's youthful in the way that she's interested in the world and she's interested in other people. She always followed the news, didn't she? Yeah. She was always more up to speed on what was happening. The last conversation I had with her, we talked about something she'd heard on the news that morning. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that curiosity about the world um, was, as you say, something that kept her youthful. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we'll talk more about her process of working a bit later. But Axel, tell us your first memories of her or, or your favourite memories of her. <coughs> Well, I don't have any anecdotes or anything, but she remembered better than me that we first met at a signing in Hatchards. This is not television, so I think I can mention names of <laughs> brands. And uh, we were we had like a Christmas signing, an author's evening at Hatchards, and that was the first time that we met. And I, of course, knew her work, and she knew the Gruffalo. And so we started chatting because it wasn't terribly busy. There wasn't a long queue at that moment. And then we also found out that we lived not far from each other. So I think after that, we had lunch once or twice or met at authors' events and publishing parties. And then I had a more... I ha I've got a journalist friend who works for the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in Germany, and he had the idea to do an interview, a joint interview at times of Brexit. Do you remember those days of the big Brexit debate? <laughs> yes, so we did, we did a long... <laughs> We did. We'll come back. We <laughs> had a long conversation with this journalist, and that was really lovely, both being German, but originally, I must say, and now British, and but with a very, very different story. For me, it was always like meeting history, and I spoke German to her, and she obviously spoke the German that she learned till she was 10 years old and left Germany. So it was like meeting history, and of course, her father was such a huge person in the 30s in Berlin in the art world. He was a theatre critic, as you've mentioned, Alfred Kerr. And one of the number one Nazi opponents. So for me, it was yes. really like, like meeting history and it was fascinating and, and wonderful. In fact, and of course, she's a wonderful person to talk to. <laughs> was. She was a wonderful person to talk to. We all that speak in, in, in the presence of her. That's really funny. <laughs> yes. Um, what you say about her father was interesting because, of course, what what transpired in 1933 was that uh, her father was number two on Hitler's blacklist. Uh, yes. She always claimed this was because he made fun of Hitler 
and Hitler was particularly uh, unhappy about like people who laughed at him. Um, and uh, so what happened when she escaped Germany was always an extraordinary story that she would tell, that they got a phone call from somebody they didn't know, and they still don't know who it was, who warned them that, uh, uh, that Alfred was on the, on the blacklist and that they should get out of the country as soon as possible. And within a week, uh, he had left, and then she, her mother um, closed up the house and took the children uh, on, a, on a train across, a little milk train across the border. Uh, to meet her father. Um, but uh, she used to tell the, the story of how close she came uh, to being caught because on the train as a child, her mother had told her not to say anything um, when they came for her to check the papers and the tickets. And uh, the, uh, the guard looked twice at their documents. And as he began to walk away, Judith began to say, well, there you see, there wasn't a problem. But she got as far as well there, and her mother gave her a look which froze her, mm. and she stopped in mid-sentence. And she said, "Had she finished the sentence, they might never have survived. Yeah. She would have lost the other eighty-three years of her life." Extraordinary. Mm. Uh, anyway, uh, Alfred, yes, uh, who who laughed at her was a was a very important figure, as you say, a theatre critic and a journalist uh, in in his lifetime. Um, tell me, both of you, what you think was the most important thing about her legacy? Is it this, that she told the story of her escape to so many school children? Is it her work? What, what mattered to you most about what she left behind? Lauren. It's hard because it changes over time. So obviously I was introduced to her work like a lot of people through her picture books. Um, the Tiger Who Came to Tea of was the picture book of my childhood, um, so I knew it very well. And I didn't know anything about her at that time, as indeed you didn't know anything about anybody in those days because we didn't have all these resources to be able to look things up. And so books stood as books and not the people behind them were not nearly so well known um, and I think that's that's what makes that so special in a way that it stands it it stands for something in my childhood without knowing what an amazing person she was and what an amazing life she had that she was able to talk about something um, and make a coziness in this story that that gave you comfort as a child and I think it was Frank Cottrell Boyce talked about this that the 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 everydayness about it was was really beautiful in that story and and nearly everyone always talks about that thing of right at the end where they go to the cafe as a treat and and he talks about that in the high street and how it how it looks and i think that's absolutely right because it something so tiny can be such a important thing in a in a child's life and i look back at my childhood and think about those sort of things that's what makes your life your life is is often those tiny details i'm just uh, i'm just going to illustrate this if i can with the night scene from tiger who came to tea which i think a lot of people i don't know if we can see that very clearly well i'm sorry we haven't got the technology to show this properly is that at all in focus can anybody see that yeah um, you can see that that, uh, that that incredible excitement that i think all children respond to the idea of being dressed up and with your parents and out at night and she's going out at nighty i think the little girl is nighty. i know isn't that exciting <laughs> it's another quick thing. but but I, so i suppose that's where it began and then there's of course when hitler stole pink rabbit and knowing that incredible story which axel just just putting in that detail just makes you realize it, it, what a big thing that was uh so there's all of that but then there's what if you look at the creatures book that you're looking at there you, you see all the where she began she's an amazing painter she's an amazing artist she designed wallpaper and fabric and so talented and she could have gone off in lots of different directions and so for me um Yes, this is a, this is a Judith Carr textile. Yeah, it's wonderful. Really textile. Beautiful yeah. things she made. Beautiful. It could be reprinted, really. I know. Somebody I should take them. 
I know, and and I know she did some she did some work for Liberties a few years years ago. But I always felt mm. like, which was beautiful. But I always felt like they should reprint these. These are wonderful. But I I think that artist part of me finds that really intriguing and really really inspiring it, because it it pushes me. It you know you have somebody there who's who's done so much in their life and is continuing to do more and more right to the very end. So that's that's really what she means to me. Yes, excellent. Um, I'm not surprised that the textiles are something that interests you because you've also been part of your work for many years, an interest in textile. Um, yes, Axel, tell me. It's, it's interesting from a German perspective because when I came to the UK in 1982, um, she, in Germany, she's much more known for her for the for the pink rabbit when Hitler stole the pink rabbit, and schools are reading her texts, and it's it's quite ironic because she always thought of herself mainly as an illustrator. But in Germany, she's much more famous for her for her for the pink rabbit, and I think hardly anybody. The, the books have been published, but I think hardly anybody would know the 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 tiger who came to tea and coming to the UK, I, I realized how, how popular and amazingly loved she is as an illustrator in, in the UK. That's interesting because uh, she Still. did say to me that Mog was published in Germany. Um, and yes. Mog, of course, yeah, is, I think they were all, yeah. Mog is female. Um, and they, uh, she was quite outraged because in Germany, they made Mog male because, and I quote, they said such an enterprising uh, creature uh, must be mm -hmm. must be male. So as a sort of act of revenge, she, sad, gave Mog, yes, yeah. she gave Mog kittens um, yeah. to, <laughs> by way of deal with that. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, apparently they, they just sort of glossed over it in the in the book that they translated. So she did appear in Germany, but you're quite right that that, that thing of yes. retelling the story of her escape from Germany for children all over the world it was a huge contribution, a very important thing to have done. And also because she took, she approached it from an angle that made it um, uh, somehow an adventure, as as I think she felt it herself. When That's she a very interesting thought. Yes. Um, so it's that it's, that being a refugee was for her. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, that exactly. Being a refugee for her was, was as a child, from the viewpoint of a child, it was an adventure, and for many children it isn't. And sometimes I, I, I wonder whether her book is so popular in Germany because it, it spares the readers from, the, from, the fate, from reading about the fate of, of so many Jewish children who were murdered. And, I mean, Anne Frank is equally known and read in Germany, but I wonder whether this kind of slightly more positive view of, of being chased away from your homeland is... Is something comforting in a way. It's it's a it's an interesting thought, I it's think, a, but I have it, no answer to that. It's a gentler approach. It makes it? it more bearable. Yes. Sorry. On the other hand, there are things in when Hitler stole Pink Rabbit about there's a there's an anecdote that she overheard as a child about a a man who a professor who was asked to who was made to lie in a kennel and bark. Um, yes. And so you know there's so uh, there are. It's there, there yes. In there. Um, yes. But it's interesting. What? Yes, you're right that she had a sort of gentle approach that meant that you could broach the subject with young children. I remember when I first met her. I think it was her 80th birthday party, um, to which I was invited. And at the end of it, a speech. She said, "I often think about uh, the people who didn't make it mm. out of Germany and what books they might have written." Yes which made yes. her hair stand up on the back of my neck. And, I, and there was something about the way it she does. could extrapolate from her own relatively happy experience mm -hmm. um, to understand there was always this implied mm -hmm. sense of the absence and the, and the loss that other people experienced. And the... And the and oh. <laughs> no, Lauren, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, we need a hand up thing. Um, Yes, I, th there's that really lovely moment when, w if you watch the Imagine documentary, which is so worth looking up, anyone who's interested, it, be, the bit where she's standing on the platform uh, at that station where they've got all the little, I think they're all little brass plaques, aren't they, in the in the platform of all the children and, and maybe all the adults as well, but everyone who was taken away. 
um, to the concentration camps. And she, she, I don't know if she talks then and there about it, but she's definitely talked, I've heard her talking about it many times, this thing of thinking about all those children and, and how she had a responsibility to make the most of her life, enjoy her life and do good things with her life because they didn't have that opportunity. And it, it's such a wonderful way of looking at terrible adversity and horror to actually think that you, your contribution to make things better is actually to live better and, and do things with your life. I think that's And right. another thing we touched upon, that's yes, right. No, go on, Axel. It's always a little bit. <laughs> and uh, something else we touched upon on in, with the interview with a German journalist is that her parents tried everything when they when they were children to to hide how absolutely desperate their situation was. And Alfred Kerr couldn't could work. He couldn't write. He couldn't write in Switzerland because the Swiss were worried that they get into trouble with the Nazis. He had French, but nobody wanted to publish his articles in France. They they were in an absolutely dire, horrible situation until he got that that job from the US to write a script for a film. And she didn't she didn't know that as a child. And I, I asked her whether she how she feels about it, that, that the parents in a way were not, were not honest with her. And she says they did absolutely the right thing. And I think later in life, she, I mean, she must have felt it as a child, how, how awful mm. it was, but mm. it was kind of hidden from her. And she only realized how and what a terrible situation both her parents were later in life, I think. Yes, she did. She said she read and she read letters for the, for, that were found by mm. a later biographer of her father, in which she learned that her mother considered suicide. In fact, she considered taking the children with her. Yes, um, uh, because she was so desperate and so depressed. But mm. that this wasn't obvious to her. Judith said that she, if she'd known all this, she couldn't have written when Hitler stole Pink Rabbit because it was written out of the the yes. memory of, of adventure and and uh, really what was an exciting experience for her to go to new countries and learn new languages, um, which she did extraordinarily well. Um, it, she did have a, a, a rare understanding though, I think of a sort of child's point of view. Mog in effect is, is a child himself, herself, mm -hmm. the cat. Um, she responds to things as if she's a child. And there was something mm. in Judith which retained uh, a, a, a youthfulness mm. uh, all her life. Yes. Uh, and I think it comes across in her drawings as well. I, I don't know how you feel, Lauren, but there's such a childlike, even, even when she was 90, she had this childlike yeah. way of drawing, I find, in a way. And that makes it really appealing, I think. Yeah. Yes. And, and there's something in the world. Yeah, when when you look at the her early drawings, so her childhood drawings, which her mother amazingly took with, they could take so little with them on that train, but she packed up uh, Judith's sketchbooks, which is an incredible thing to do. And uh, and you look at the sophistication of them. You know, she was able to draw from such a young age, and so even when her her illustrations look quite childlike and and um, innocent. You know, she, she's the most incredible artist, and you can't. I think you can't really draw like that unless you have that that sort of um, underpinning of of actually knowing how mm -hmm. to design, knowing how to to draw something beautifully. So. Yes, and it's an extraordinary thing that her mother, uh, taking one suitcase, knew that taking mm -hmm. Judith's drawings. Was it important. something important? Yes. Yeah. Um, perhaps you could just talk a little bit. I mean, it's interesting what you say about the childishness, but I'd be interested to hear from you, Lauren, a bit more about the the technique and her style. She worked in inks in the Tiger Who Came to Tea. She worked in pastels and pencil crayons later. Um, mm. Obviously, she'd been a painter at art school. Mm. Um, what uh, what uh, do you think about that? evolution was there were there differences in her style over the years was do we do we always get the same thing when we looked at Judith Carbot no I think like any any artist her work evolves and and changes and I I mean I, I think you see that with any anyone even even if you think someone like Quentin Blake has got a very strong Quentin Blake style there are, there are still differences because he's always experimenting just just as 
as Judith was. And I remember since she, uh, we, we got chatting about pro markers because I just discovered these pro markers actually from looking at a child's drawing. And I just thought, oh, that's amazing. And I was asking my friend about her daughter's work. He said, oh yeah, you these things. And so I started using them. Oh, they give such a wonderful uh, result. And, um, and so I talked, I was chatting to Judith on the phone one day. She, oh, they sound really great. So I bought her some. And, and sent them to her. And and that's that sort of, whether she used them, or, you know, she probably had a go with them, but you you do find things that really work for you. But but I, I, I mean, I'm always experimenting with things, but she she definitely was as well. And, um, and you see how, how her line changes over time. And it gets a little bit more sort of hazy. It, it gets, everything gets sort of lighter and lighter and more and more delicate, I think, as she gets older. And of course, she did the extraordinary thing of branching out into a new format altogether in her 90s uh, when she wrote Mr. Cleghorn's Seal, because she decided she liked the idea of doing black and white pencil drawings mm -hmm. for illustrations. So she wrote a story to go to go with them. Uh, and then, of course, The Curse of the School Rabbit was a similar format. Um, so, you know, at 90 something, she thought, oh, I'll try I'll try something different. I'll try something that looks mm. um, new. And still, still saying it's it's always a struggle to draw. I think that's very. <laughs> I, I can I can feel I can sympathize with that. But she she always said yeah it's always it's always a challenge. Mm. Always have to. She uh, she said she she was somebody who spent more time rubbing out than they spent drawing. <laughs> yes, well, I think that's so true of, of you know what because I, I always I. I recently sort of did a, t a tiny sort of speeded up film of showing me putting something together and people, you know, like, oh, that's really interesting. I said, but in a way it's a betrayal because it, it, the idea then is it looks so easy and it's as if I find it effortless, but you haven't seen the hours and hours of coming up with the idea, realizing it's wrong, doing it again, putting it together, it doesn't work. And and that's just what Judith always used to say about it. It's, it just isn't easy. Mm. And it's that's a nicer thing to tell people because otherwise it's like you're some kind of genius. And you, you're not. <laughs> and of course, one of the extraordinary things about her was that in order to come up with ideas for books, she would walk every day. She would mm. walk from Barnes to Hammersmith and back. Um, and quite briskly, I walked with her and had to speed up a bit. Um, Yes. And uh, that obviously kept her fit. She ran up the stairs to her studio and so on every, every day. But it was very important to her to walk because while she was walking, she was thinking and getting the ideas for her books. It was a very interesting um, uh, creative process. Mm -hmm. Walking, was, In fact, when she had to have a hip replacement, she said the problem was she couldn't draw anymore because she couldn't walk, so she yeah. couldn't have ideas. So she yeah. couldn't draw. Mm -hmm. um, and then she bounced back with astonishing speed <laughs> and was marching off to Hammersmith again in no time at all. Um, uh, I just want to come back to the question of uh, her, um, uh, the qualities of character that she had, which we've sort of alluded to. We've talked a little bit about her work and her process of working. But uh, I think that one of the reasons why we love her so much and why we're here talking about her is because of the impact that she made on us as a person. Do you have memories of things that she said or did that made you think, I mean, I feel like I now want to be more Judith. Mm. You know? <laughs> so it's almost like a motto yeah. um, because of the kind of person she was. Do you well, feel that? I definitely feel that. I think about her nearly every day, actually. She's one of those people that's made one of the biggest impressions on me and as a person uh, aside from her her work which I admire it was it was her and I miss her particularly now because I really want to talk to her now about everything because she's a very steadying person to talk to um, and I think the way that she talked to everybody as an equal she had very strong views about things and she didn't take any nonsense um and she's no pushover but she you know it, she responded to people who were interested in things and and 
wanted to talk to her. She also was she, it, just that sort of kindness and understanding. I've I've really learnt from being around it. And a personal anecdote would be when um, um, we went over for tea when my daughter was very small. She was probably only four, and we were sitting around the table, the four of us, and and my daughter got bored like you do and because <laughs> we're all chatting and uh and and i uh in, and she whispered in my ear very much too loudly i want to see judith's bedroom and and i've like you know me and my partner were quite embarrassed because like well yeah okay well, we're not going to do that and judith just said sorry and what did you say and and asked her and she repeated it and she went but of course you do and then she gave her a tour of the entire house. And it's that really, you know, important understanding that a child is a person, is interested in things, wants to know you better. This is the best way to get to know someone, just to sort of see their things. And it's like Judith understood that completely. You know, what, what you know, so hostly to say, yes, of course, rather than, oh, no, I'd rather not show you my bedroom. She showed her. And then they both understand each other much more clearly. And now you have to tell us what Judith's bedroom was like. I have, I mean, honestly, for me, I've never met anybody who has lived so many years and has so few possessions. She just, she's quite mm. a minimalist. So you'd go into her sitting room, she had that wonderful sort of, um, it's almost like a collage of postcards and lovely things. I oh, always saw lots of axles beautiful envelopes and things that she would have up because you always decorate your envelopes and and so she'd have but she'd have postcards and photographs and things and they were sort of on the wall but then everything else was so sort of chicly spare in and in, in a beautiful way it was it was very very curated i always felt mm -hmm. lovely Axel, tell us about your I, personal memories of her and your sense of her personal quality. I don't, I don't have any anecdotes, and we, we only met, she came here for lunch a few times, or so we met at her favorite Italian restaurant in Barnes, and I, I went to her house a few times, but I, I don't have any, any sort of big anecdotes, but I was, as, you, as was mentioned before, the, her incredible curiosity and the freshness of her thinking. She was like a young person. I mean, she sometimes she forgot things, but... Her, her way of, of thinking and talking was amazing, <laughs> incredible. And, and yes. yeah, really refreshing to see somebody who is that old. I mean, my, my mother had dementia when she was like in her 70s, so completely different perception of, of an old person, what they can be like. <laughs> so yeah, very, I, I very impressive. Is... And missed, as, as Lauren says, I, I would like to meet her again and chat mm. at things, development. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the reasons that she was so incredibly popular at events, we did um, 32 events together, I believe. Um, and every on every single occasion, I was aware of the audience falling in love with her. Um, and people would tweet afterwards things like, um, is it wrong that I wish she was my granny? Um, and I think one of the reasons that people fell so much in love with her when they saw her, I mean, she was, she was funny and mm. she was charming and she was quick witted. Uh, and up to date, yes. as you say, she would she would Google things and so on, and uh, you know, and was was not completely unaware of technology and all of that. Um, but it was partly that she gave people hope that this is what their old age might be like, mm. that they would be still working, that they would be they would hold yes. an audience, that they would be charming and funny and busy and active and fit and all the things that she was. Um, so she 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 gave everybody in the audience this sort of thing, thought, you know, this is what I'm going to be like when I'm 93 or 95 or whatever. Um, and, uh, and it was a very hopeful thing. Yes. Because she modeled it so beautifully, how, how you might be old and productive and, and charming and, uh, and on the ball about everything. Um, so I think uh, she also modeled not only how to be old, but, uh, in the end, I hope I can say this, how to die. Mm. I, I mean, the story that I heard yes. was that she, her last day, she drank champagne with her son and daughter, with Matthew and Tacey, and um, tried to eat a bit of smoked salmon. 
and then said I feel very tired and lay down and went to sleep in fact she was already lying down went to sleep and didn't mm. wake up again uh, and I, th I think Judith makes us feel this this hope for this splendid old age and this peaceful passing but, and that, um, that but also that really lovely talking in the present always that I yeah. keep trying to remember to do to do that to to not tunnel forward or regret backwards but um she i remember speaking to her i i don't know how many days before she died but it was close and i was chatting to her and then she was talking to me about the beautiful things she could see she was in bed and she would just say i'm so lucky i live in the most beautiful place and i can see the trees out of my window and the way that they flicker in the, the sun and everything and it was just that so sort of beautiful being so appreciative of what she had and did just those tiny little things. Um, and that that was pretty inspiring. And she also really made me laugh as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't remember what she said now, but there was just something so fantastic. When you say about the funny, I think that's the thing that, that was most striking about her. She had the most perfect comic timing and she knew it, you know. She really knew mm -hmm. how to hold an audience. <clears throat> And she also she would collect things that happened to her and turn them into anecdotes that she was ready to tell yeah. um, to friends and to audiences. And you could see her um, <clears throat> sort of reshaping her experience in order to make it amazing. Mm. So that I can remember her, for instance, telling the story about um, well, when she had had her hip replacement, she said the the doctor said to me it might not just might not be old age; it might be um, something that I used to do in my youth that has caused the wear and tear and she said so i'm i have a hip replacement not because i'm old but because i used to do the can can <laughs> <laughs> and i just love the idea that there's some image of her um, yes. but you're right about the, see, the appreciating the moment that was always something she did didn't she and i can again i, I can remember her talking about how just the journey to an event sitting in a a car on the way there looking at things people on the street the light the sunshine the trees um how the people who hadn't survived nazi germany how much they would have given for just a moment mm. of this experience that she had had mm. um and i think I, that's one of the things i take with me if you want to be like her appreciative of the moment was that something you felt, Axel, when you talked to her? Yes, I, I, well, I can't. I can't remember any any particular conversation about that. But her whole personality was was yeah, yeah. You, you could feel that she was like that, like Lauren describes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to tell the story of the last time I saw her, um, that I'd I'd picked up an award on her behalf because she wasn't very well. And so I went round to drop off the award and the citation um, and the speeches, a copy of the speeches that people had given about her. Um, and I thought, she, I know she's not very well, you know, I'll perhaps see her for 10 minutes, make her a cup of tea or something, make sure she's comfortable, leave again. Um, wasn't really expecting her to be very mobile. And when I arrived, she was standing in her front garden in a beautiful summer frock with pearls. Um, and uh, uh, when we went in, I said, shall I put the kettle on? And she said, or we could have a martini <laughs> and uh, we sat in the garden in the sunshine and chatted for an hour and a half yeah. um drinking martini and talking about one of the things she said was i have yeah. so many happy memories that uh, there was a again this sense of extraordinary appreciation of her life and her she told anecdotes about her family um, but she was also talking about what was on the news and about her horror at brexit and <laughs> all of these things and um uh, it was, it was, I, I, unfortunately, I thought reports of her illness had been exaggerated. She was going to be all right, Judith, um, because yeah, she nobody could so believe she would die. Mm. And um, of course, that was the last time I saw her about a month later when she died. Um, but uh, I'm going to give the audience a chance to ask some questions, uh, the virtual audience. Somebody, uh, uh, here uh, behind the scenes the wonderful Richard Beale has been following the chat 
Um, and so I'm going to ask Richard to come in and pick out any questions that he might have picked up. Otherwise, I shall ask some more. Richard, tell oh, us. You're, you're, you're too kind, that. Nicolette. That's very kind. We've got some terrific questions here. There's a simple one, but I think it's a really important one, especially leading on from the fun uh, times that you've had with Judith. And it was simply this, and this is our, our top voted question, actually. What made Judith laugh? She made us all laugh and she made us fall in love with her, as you said. But what made her laugh? Um, well, one of the glorious things about her was she was very free with laughter. Um, so if, ever, if somebody else made a joke or was funny, uh, she, would, she would engage with it. She would appreciate your jokes, didn't she? Mm. Um, and that was part of the warmth of her. I always love people who laugh at other people's jokes. Mm. Um, and she did that very readily. I'm trying to think what, about what subjects in particular. Um, she laughed at herself. That was one thing. But um, uh, I remember her being very amused. Lauren, you were there. There was an occasion we did an event in Cheltenham. Yes. And um, she was about to read from The Tiger Who Came to Tea. And mm. uh, she reached into her bag to get her glasses and pulled out a hairbrush by accident. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and uh, uh, she had to borrow my glasses in the end to, in order to read it. But there was something, she was, she was so amused at herself yeah. for having accidentally packed, you know, for having thought she had her glasses in there, but what felt like her glasses was actually a hairbrush instead. I um, think that she was very inclusive. That I think you're absolutely right. And and so she she was, it was like sort of having your school friend often, I, I always found. And I remember her phoning me up one day and we were both meant to be working and she phoned up to say, um, I've got to have my cataracts done, but I keep calling them my cormorants. She kept getting go, because <laughs> it sounds the same. She said, phoning up and say, I've got to get my cormorants done. And, 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 she just she sort of loved things like that. It, it even thinking about herself saying that that thing made her laugh, and it's quite infectious when someone finds themselves quite funny too. Do you have any memories, Axel, of things particularly? I don't have any laughter. I, I don't laugh myself, so I don't. Have <laughs> oh, you don't laugh yourself? Oh, you, you weren't making her laugh. I bet you were, and you just forgot. I, I, I just <laughs> nothing comes to me right now. I should yeah, have right, thought about it. Right. Another question, Richard. What else have we got? Sure. Um, well, we've got uh, two, one comment from Kate Stevens and a, and a question, but I'll just the comment first uh, about. Um, Judith doing the can-can. So she's challenged uh, Axel and Lauren to, to draw Mrs. Carr doing the can-can. <laughs> so there's your challenge. But Kate's also Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes. Barnes yeah. Festival. Okay. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Got a year you. time. Yes, practice. <laughs> uh, no, I'll read out the question in full. I want to do it justice. So Kate is a children's librarian. Um, she said, hi, question to both on Mrs. Carr's legacy. A superb body of work, Tiger has never been out of print. Oh, that's impressive. But is it the picture books that open up a child's imagination or, and Kate says she's been privileged to hear her speak twice about her life once in Barnes, or the out of the Hitler time books that have opened a child's eyes, eyes to the wider world, leaving age out of this, are they equal or does one have a greater legacy? So just the, the nub of that question, is it the picture books that open up a child's imagination or the out of Hitler time books that open a child's eyes to the wider world? Yes, I think, Axel, do you have a, a thought about that? Because you were talking about its popularity in German. I think they are, they're both equally valid and important and great pieces of, of art and literature. And yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to say which one is more important or better or... <laughs> It, as, as I said, in Germany, she's she's very well known and important, famous for for her for her writing more than her illustration. And in this country, it's different. So it's it's an amazing achievement to have those two things um, that she's that she's done, and that are so important for for the readers. Do you have any thoughts about that? No. Yeah. Well, I I mean the the wonderful thing about any any piece of art, whether it's music, painting dance whatever but and and very much so with books is that they once they are a book they're yours and how you react to them is completely up to you as the reader or, or the 
viewer if you're if you're reading pictures because a lot of people just can only <clears> read <throat> pictures and then you read them together some people are more visual than they're le less wordy and so both are entirely necessary and um, I think it's wonderful that she illustrated her longer texts as well because it's very inclusive that way and it reaches out to many more people because because yes some of us need more images or respond better to images but both are, are fantastic I mean and whatever you get from a, a book is 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 what you need I think I think we take what we need from books. Yes, I think I think we all believe in the value of picture books and the value of images really all your life you know, mm. it's not the thing you grow out of um, but also, uh, I, I would say that the experience of sitting on platforms with her and watching her talk about the memory of Germany did seem to me an incredibly important legacy because I thought there were, you know, there were nine year olds and younger often in audiences who I thought would, you know, if they lived to be her age, they could tell their grandchildren and great grandchildren <laughs> about this charming and wonderful woman that they had met who nearly was murdered for no reason other than the fact that she was Jewish. And I thought that being yeah. a, a witness to that in front of those children and being the kind of person she was, who everybody loved so much, made her an incredibly important ambassador. So the books, yes, opening up the wider world, but also the personal uh, expression of that seemed to me it was an extraordinary thing to witness and, and be part of. And I thought it mattered a great deal that mm. she did it. Um, yeah. And I hope that people will never forget it who saw her do that. Thank you for that. Um, yes, Richard. Sorry, another Mark. question Richard. from Jenny, another one of our high voted questions. I'll read it out. And I think it leads on nicely from what you've just discussed. Uh, what do you think Judith would have made of how life has changed so much in the last few months? What do you think her picture book response would have been, Jenny, who's uh, another child's librarian? Yes. Any thoughts, Axel? I I would find it really hard to speculate. I mean, it's it's so something that's so unexpected to all of us that happened. And yeah, she would have lived through it. She would have stayed at home and probably go for her walk still. And I don't know whether it would have influenced her her work or her style or or or, or the the subject matter she writes about. I, I doubt that, but. Yeah, it's 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 hard to tell. I don't, I can't really answer that. <laughs> what do you think, Lauren? I suppose I I I, I rather agree with um, I, Axel in that that I think she, I don't I don't I don't think you necessarily see it picking up in her work in a very obvious way. But I think she would feel all the more reason to work. I think because that's that's what she was like and i i agree i sort of thoroughly believe she would have survived it you know this oh, yes I you think, know, yeah let's see why she wouldn't i think i think she would have also been very shocked about certain things in this country and the development in this country i don't want to turn this into a political yeah. thing but yeah. she would have not liked what's happening with this government yeah. and what britain was and what britain is like now and the idea of having neo-nazis defending Churchill statue which is in a box is completely I mean how how can you make any sense of that Sh shouting England England with a Hitler Hitler greeting mm. and defending Churchill that doesn't make any sense at all and she would have despaired mm. to see that would mm. have despaired yes. that's one thought I have now yeah, yeah. I think you're right that she would have been really shocked distressing. but I, I'm not sure that despair was a thing she did I think that there, 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 no, okay. uh, there's also part of me that thinks that she would have, I mean, we're all finding that the, you know, the world is full of anxiety and fear and horror and dread. Um, and at the same time, Jesus. there are small pleasures in things that are happening to us at home, especially if we're the fortunate And she would have seen those, yes. Are. Yeah. And she would have seen them. She would have recognised that if you're yeah. at home. No, you're right. And you can. Work, That's you why I said I didn't want to speculate. So. Yeah. <laughs> and but also yeah. your your work can be, you know, I'm I'm not working working on anything directly, you know, about what's going on, but it influences my work in a way, even if it 
it comes in in a slightly left field way what you yes. so I, I did start writing a book about grief because that's mm. what seems to be going on I don't mean just you know grief of someone dying but grief generally about loss and and so I think you can write about things in a in a sideways way but you, she will have been influenced because we're all influenced if you're interested yes. in what's going on in the world Mm. Yes, I, I see somebody commenting. She would have looked at the bright side, and I think that's true. I think mm. we, that mm. is very likely. Yes, um, that's but right. She also yeah. did allow um, uh, sadness to influence. I mean, she wrote My Henry after her husband Tom died, um, which was a fantasy about an old lady with very happy memories. Um, so, in a way, it was a way of turning a sadness into something happy, but the sadness had found its way in there when she wrote uh, the great granny gang that was about the camaraderie of old yeah. ladies uh, who are widowed um and again that was a funny and exaggerated story but it was something that was informed by her sense of what was actually going on so she might have done that a picture book that had some sense mm -hmm. of what was happening mm -hmm. but i think uh, as as commentators all believe she would have stayed positive and i think they're right yes um uh Richard, have we got another question? Yeah, this this is uh, from Jemima, age nine, and it's going back to what uh, uh, Judith's favourite things were. I think Jemima wants to know what Judith's favourite book was, but I think it's both what was the favourite book of hers, but also what was her favourite book that someone else might have uh, published. Yes, no idea. I'm sure she was asked this question. Um, uh, when she was young, her father... Uh, didn't read to her very much, but he read. He told her the plots of operas, so she was very. She enjoyed the, the plots of operas. Um, uh, I remember her being asked who was her favourite artist or illustrator, and she said Rembrandt. Um, so uh, I don't know if she the uh, what the what the book answer would have been. I wish I knew. She was very enthusiastic about other people's work, particularly contemporary, the work of other contemporaries. She would have liked Lauren and Axel's work very much. Um, but I don't, I don't remember her giving a particular favourite ever. She had the odd thing of, of losing her childhood books um, and not coming to a lot of children's books until later. Mm. Uh, so I'm not sure. I wonder, I wonder if uh, she seemed so passionate about everything that her favourite book was what she was working on at the moment yes she certainly was passionate about the fact of being able to work um which was she said what saved her after she was widowed um that to be able to go on working was a source of incredible um satisfaction and delight to her so yes i think she was very happy to be engaged though as axel said she also found it difficult it wasn't it wasn't all blissful it was some of it was an effort yes. Yeah. She was a professional, let's face it. Um, the um, I know we've talked about what we love about Judith and her books, but what do you think is the, the, the magic about her staying power? I mean, her books have never been out of print. What, what is specifically about it that, that people love so much? Yes, where do they last, Axel? What do you think? Um... That's a difficult question, but I think it's it's that her work was really absolutely her, and she had a very personal style. And and this, I would not say childishness, but this is childlike view. There's also a certain. I know she's been trained as an artist and everything, but there's a certain imperfection in her drawings. She's not somebody, and you can see that it is a struggle. And I think that's something. Um, which which appeals to people subconsciously. And I, I have that myself. I always say I can't draw and people laugh, but I have that feeling that I that I'm not very I'm not a there's some some artists who can draw perfectly, like Chris Riddell or I can't name many other colleagues. But I think there's there's a certain naive, I would call it naive charm or something that is there if you if you're not perfect at drawing. And I think that's something that children and parents can feel and see and it makes makes art more you have you have an easier access to it an easier link and makes it makes it more 
yeah loved by by the public and i think there's something in her work that is is there it's it's in a way it is perfect as an expression of her personality it's it's not perfect artistically or you can see that's really her her personal view and i think that's a, that's an important part and it's makes it kind of timeless because it's not it's not following a fashion or anything you can see that the drawings were done a long time ago but they still work because of that personality that's in there i think that's yes. my theory <laughs> yeah it's very, i think that both things are true both the, the the sense of her in them and also as you say the sense of um not being somehow out of reach as illustrations um and i think yes. if something is uh, if it feels so um sophisticated then it's very difficult for people to to imagine themselves drawing it that's mm. part of it and i mm. think it's, yes it's they're inspiring in that sense because it make you want to draw i think and there are some people who are so skilled it's hard to imagine that i think they have a real warmth because she she you warmth feel she, yeah she's on the side of the child and there are other there are other artists i look at like john burningham and i think he's on the side of the child and you feel it and in the work and with judith definitely and i think she could have chosen to do these much more sort of sophisticated looking drawings but it's almost as if she's working her way in to the telling of the story in that way that that's the kind of drawing that works with this story and it reaches out to the child rather than as a barrier look at how beautifully i can i can show this um and yes there's i think like most most illustrators and artists it, it takes an effort and my, definitely i feel that and why shouldn't it You're doing most things it should take an effort but she there's a delicacy because i think she's responding to the story that she's writing you know, or has written also because it things were inspired by her experience of ordinary life yeah so that gives them a kind of accessibility too and yes. all through her life she went on being inspired by those ordinary things yeah. um so uh and she talked about the funny things that that uh, her original Mog, she had 13, uh, mm. 13 different cats eventually. Um, but the things that the cat did, that this Mog did like to eat eggs, for instance. Um, and also that they were, she, that she found that the ways cats behaved, eccentric and amusing. Mm. And, um, and so what she was doing was using a sort of everyday observation. And I think that's a very lasting thing if you feel that you can kind of recognize things about yeah. this. and rather like i think that axel's absolutely right about the timeless thing and and it makes it very accessible and as you say nicolette that that thing of she could see the peculiarity in the everyday those things that make life so particular and interesting and i've always been most interested in that and the, in the weird that is you see it every day but it's it's noticing it and she noticed it yes and she i mean there were things too like katinka's tale the picture book that, which is one of her later works um which was based on the fact that the cat that she had at the time katinka mm. had a stripy tail and most of the rest of her was white mm. and um so you decide suddenly you had the idea that this tail might have magic powers mm. she said i don't know why it took me so long to come up with this you know that uh, that noticing the sort of potential of the oddity of things that were actually very close to you was a skill that she had mm. um and uh, and that she turned those into something in this case literally magical but in all senses magical mm. um, yes richard is there anything else yeah anybody we're, else we're, to we're coming very very close i, I just Brilliant. do have um, um a question but but just for just a brief answer but i also want to say that one of my volunteers just contacted me and as we wrap up the festival today we're going to wrap up with martinis and champagne and raise a glass to to, to judith oh. Um, yes, please. Just very briefly, what, uh, and then, then I'll hand over to you, Nicolette, for, for closing comments, is what's the one thing you would like people to remember about Judith? Lauren, don't know if we've lost Axel. We seem to have lost him. Um, disappeared. <laughs> oh, that's good. We can hear you, voice. Axel. Disembodied voice. You can answer the question. Good. So, Lauren, tell us first, what's the one thing you'd like people to remember? 
Well, I, th I suppose it's the thing that I remember, which I was saying earlier, that it's it's just a way of being and a generosity of, and I, I think being interested in other people and um, being aware of what they're doing and that sort of thing is, is, is a very generous response to life and um and i i've always i mean from from the second i met her i had nothing but that coming back to me always she would always ask about my family um she'd always remember the the tiniest little details that had happened on an occasion that we'd met and she'd laugh with you and, and when I say about that school thing, it really was like having a school friend. And, and she would say, do you remember when that happened? And there's something so nice. So even if she was telling an anecdote that where I hadn't even been alive, it felt like we were having a conversation between us. And I, I think that's a remarkable skill is to include people in your life rather than sit there telling them about you. I think that's right. Axel, what was the one thing? Yeah, I would say? agree with that. And... Yeah, I have similar similar thoughts about that. But I, I also the what what you mentioned, Nicolette, to to see what an old person can be like, and that old persons are really not different from. Mm. And she's somebody who really like anybody more like anybody else shows that. I mean, I, I don't have very very much contact with people over ninety or never had, but to show that somebody. I mean, we, we don't really change. We stay the same all through our life. And that's a big lesson. And for me personally, it was, yeah, her, her positivity and her yeah. all that. And also for me personally, meeting meeting up with somebody who sort of almost embodies history. Yeah. Yeah. Like making a link to the, to the 1930s in Germany. And yeah, that was a really special experience that I had. For me, I'm I think what I'd like, people, I'd like people to take away the savoring of the moment that she had you know yes her gratitude for everything that happened to her that it was all joyous and interesting and even when bad things happened yes she would she would laugh about it you know uh, um and make a funny story out of an accident that happened to her or whatever um yeah. so i think that uh, it was yeah i want to i want to have her capacity to enjoy things mm. i think yes so i think i'm going to have to round up because we've run out of time but uh I hope people go away with a sense of Judith and uh, newly inspired to look at her books again. A big thank you to Richard Beale for chasing um, the the uh, the chat, and thank My you pleasure. to all who joined in. Um, the, just to tell you again that this afternoon at three p.m. you can hear the great actor Stanley Tucci read *The Tiger Who Came to Tea*, uh, which uh, is worth going to is going to be worth talking into for at three o'clock. Um, and by tomorrow, if you missed it this morning, you can hear the wonderful storyteller Liz Frost interactively telling Mog stories. And uh, you can also learn on the festival fa Facebook page or YouTube how to make Mog's face out of Lego. <laughs> Thank you all for being with us. Great. And be more Judith. Yes, that's a good motto. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Thank you, Nicolette. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank Bye you. for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.